right. Everyone took a seat. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Um, we were just talking about uh, earlier about the sovereign wealth funds, and we ended that session talking about sustainability and impact investment and the role sovereign wealth funds should play along those lines. We're going to carry on with this theme here on impact investing. Uh, our planet faces massive economic, social, and environmental challenges. The urgency is obvious to everyone. We can see it in the climate change, the mass migration, and the deepening social inequality in the world. To combat these, the UN Sustainable Development Goals have defined global priorities for 2030. They represent an exceptional opportunity to eliminate extreme poverty and put the world on a sustainable path. They consist of 17 aspirational goals with 169 targets. All those goals are interlinked and focus on ending poverty, protecting the planet, gender equality, and prosperity for all. Realizing sustainable development goals means undertaking a massive effort to deploy capital, requiring trillions in new capital every year. Business and industry stakeholders must do their fair share and their part to support the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. But the question is, will the corporate efforts be of a scale that will match the scale of the need? And to answer these questions and take a jab at this, um, I'm delighted to have my esteemed panelists here. Uh, not in any particular order, but just the order that I wrote them down. Mr. Yusuf Al Banyan, Vice Chairman and CEO of Sabic. Mr. Tariq Al Sadhan, CEO of Riyadh Bank. Mr. Sultan Bin Islayim, Chairman and CEO of DP World. Mr. Eric Cantor, Vice Chairman and MD at Molis. And Michael Froman, Vice Chairman and President, Strategic Growth MasterCard. And Mr. Frederick Odea, the CEO of Societe Generale. And let me start with you, uh, Mr. Cantor. SDGs, are they just about doing good, or are they really good business? Well, I think the answer to that is yes and yes. The, uh, you know, the aspirational goals that the United Nations put out certainly are those things that we would all aspire to. However, when a business uh, begins to sort of focus on what maybe can be in its interest in terms of its business strategy. I think um, just being for the aspirational goals isn't necessarily going to translate into good business. I can tell you that at our firm, what we've begun to see is our, our biggest asset we know is talent. Uh, and the millennial generation, not just in the US but around the world, is increasingly interested uh, in what we are doing uh, in pursuit of ESG and uh, thereby incorporate the uh, goals set forward by the UN. And uh, we've, 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 I think, uh, begun to say it is good business for us because if we want to attract and retain good talent, then we ought to make sure that we're providing for, uh, let's say, gender equality in the workplace and equal pay uh, and a decent career opportunity for both. So. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we put into motion. Uh, we've hired individuals specifically focused on inclusion and diversity. Uh, we've got uh, fellowships, programs targeted to uh, <clears throat> socioeconomically uh, underrepresented demographics. Uh, so it certainly is good business for us. And I think many of our clients are beginning to see, uh, not just in the area of talent, but certainly in the area of product development, uh, business models that it, it can mean good business. Mm -hmm. Mr. Froman, would short-term gains be put on to one side to achieve long-term sustainable development? How could SDGs drive the change in business model from a shareholder model to a stakeholder model? So first, I think it's important that we not create a false dichotomy between shareholders and stakeholders. I think ultimately, investing in your people, as, as Eric said, uh, investing in your communities in which you're operating, that is in the long-term shareholder interest. That's how you create long-term shareholder value. And our whole corporate system is based on shareholder value. We need to integrate these goals into it, not consider them something outside. As you said in your introduction, if we're going to hit the SDGs, there isn't enough foreign assistance or philanthropy in the world, as important as those are, 
to do so. We've got to mobilize the private sector, its resources, it, its ingenuity. And that means really looking at business models, products, technology, services, expertise, and figuring out how to achieve commercially sustainable social impact. The only way corporations are going to do this is something other than a hobby if it pays for itself, if it is commercially sustainable. And that means working with our partners, nonprofits and governments, international organizations, to get them more comfortable that there is a role for the private sector in doing this and doing so in a way that can stand on its own two feet. But not all shareholders are long-term shareholders. Some of them are short-term, and maybe that wouldn't sit well with them. Look, I think you can explain to, as we have uh, at MasterCard, look, when, when we, we took $500 million of the 2017 tax cut and put it towards inclusive growth. Um, and we explained that to the market. And the market understood that from our perspective, having economies that are more inclusive around the world, bringing more people into the financial system, that's good for business. You know, this doing good isn't just about feeling good, it's good for business. And that's a fundamental business model. Mr. Rubinian, from myriad goals and targets included in the SDGs, what are the specific ones that apply to your business? And how will you tangibly integrate those into your operational processes and internal decision making at SABIC? First of all, Nasser, I just would like to say that uh, I'm really privileged and honored to be part of this conference and with the uh, distinguished guest. Uh, let me start with the fact that uh, uh, before I respond to your questions, that we need to uh, just echo what Michael is saying. There are so much good reason for companies to have a stronger commitment for SDGs in order for them to improve in their competitive positions. And I think the companies who are not going to take this seriously is going to face a lot of positions in the future to maintain competitive position for their shareholders. In terms of the way that SABIC is looking at it, we have taken it an integral part of our strategy, and we have a very clear roadmaps for our basically sustainability reports. We have taken 10, we embrace 10 of those uh, goals, and they have been integrated also in our business plan. And not only this, also we have taken it even further uh, through a clear KPIs and performance targets. But what exactly about? We are supporting the sustainability that basically we want to build sustainable infrastructures. We want to make sure that we preserve the environment and resources. In addition to this, we want to also have a protections for food security. We want to have a very clear fight for anything against climate changes. And more importantly, we want to promote circular economy. So these are integral part of SABIC business, and it's going to be a very important for us to take it further. But one thing that is also very important is how can we look at the benefits for our shareholders. At the end of the day, we are need to look for the bottom line. But in addition to the bottom line, you need to bring something that can bring widen benefits to society, to environments, and wider economy. And I think this is the way that companies can have really a very successful retain investment. I have, I have to say that there are a very good sovereignty funds that they have been attractive into SABIC at this point. Some of them, they have already invested. Some of them talking to us to even to invest in SABIC, and they were looking out about our sustainability targets, and we need to communicate it out effectively. So you take the box for these funds in terms of sustainability uh, goals and efforts? I think we have reached a very good level of sustainability targets, which I can uh, later on uh, mm -hmm. shed light on them, but I think is the most important, you need to walk the talk. And you need to look at it as good business rather than just something that you need to comply with. Put the money where your mouth is, basically. Absolutely. Mr. Ben Slayim, what, what SDGs are relevant to DP World? I mean, I'm sure oceans are very important for you guys. Definitely. Uh, first of all, I'm honored to be with you here today. And I tell you, for us, sustainability, uh, inclusion, uh, safety, of course, and development uh, are important. It is actually uh, necessities. Uh, it's not an option really to be sustainable. And I'll give you an example. In, in the port, for example, uh, to, we have a goal to be green. And when you talk to people, they will say, well, it's going to cost more. Actually, we converted all our equipment that work in diesel to electric. 
And the result, we saved a lot of money. It used, so in the beginning, people think it's going to cost them more, but in reality, it's going to cost So the initial investment is big. It's not, not much. But the um, benefits are? In, in, in Jabal Ali, for example, we have the largest rooftop solar power generation for all our offices. We consume 30 megawatts, and we produce 40 or 45. So that is an advantage for us. Uh, when you come to inclusion, we believe, and we put a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, diversity and also inclusion. Uh, today, it is the age of the mind. Today is the age of ideas. And so when you look at countries, countries' wealth are not measured by the wealth they have, but how many good ideas, innovative ideas that the population produce. Companies also depend on their market cap on how many ideas are deployed. Mm -hmm. Not just said deployed in our business. Yes. And we've seen that as a company. And so today, it's important to have diversity. It's important to have gender equality. In a, we have an innovation in our port. Many of the innovation we had, it is really not because we just wanted it, because the business have forced us. Technology forced us to be faster in our operation. And so we moved from an operation whereby there is a man handing a crane into an automation. And when we applied, Indeed. many ladies actually applied. And to today, we have female work operators. Indeed. Um, Mr. Sethan, why should the private sector uh, invest in SDGs from your point of view? Thank you. I believe they should invest in the uh, sustainable development goals for, for many reasons. I'll highlight two of them, uh, to be precise. First, it is a social responsibility. We are a corporate working on a community, and we have a responsibility toward this community. The second element, corporate can benefit out of these social developments. Some of them might be a quick wins and good return on investment, and some of them will take a longer time to, to get the return on this investment. But in general, all the 17 SDGs will benefit the, the private sector big time in the, in the long term. And it's fair to say that recently, in the, in the last five, three to five years in Saudi, we have witnessed uh, a, a big transformation when it comes to sustainability, moving from the classical corporate social responsibility more toward the sustainability. And the fact that the, our kingdom's vision 2030 also touches on so many of these 17 initiatives. And by aligning ourselves as a private sector to the government focus on these initiatives, we will, we will get a good return on investment. So it is a good return on investment, and it is also a part of our corporate social responsibility to our community. Mr. Odea, the role of the banking sector in all of what we heard or just heard and in directing capital into positive impact investment is central to achieving the SDGs. How can banks develop the right financial products and solutions that can attract those investments? And how are you gauging your client demand to such products? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, let me also highlight, like my colleagues, that uh, there is really no choice. Uh, and when you talk about sustainability, I would like to, to emphasize that it's really the, the young generation which are uh, focusing on this topic and how any company can think that, uh, of course, not only uh, the young generation, but the parents of the young generation, which are your staff, your clients, uh, you, you can not be involved in that. So regarding this topic, uh, first of all, of course, climate is, is climate change is probably the top priority. We were one of the pioneers of the United Nations Environment Program Finance Initiative, which is one of the response to the SDGs uh, challenges. And what does that mean? It means uh, contributing effectively to the finance of the energy transition, financing renewable, but of course beyond this, having very precise policies, strategies in terms of how do you want to handle the fossil energies. Uh, and regarding, uh, that means flagging your credit, where your loans, your, when, to whom you provide loans, 
and of course uh, uh, everything related your, uh, to your asset management business and how you uh, move forward in terms of investment products. I just would like to highlight another topic which I think is a little bit more differentiating because everybody focuses on climate, which is Africa. When you look at the SDGs goals and the need for finance, half of the gap is in Africa. And I must say we have uh, committed to Africa at a time where a lot of international banks with probably a smaller presence are withdrawing from Africa. And we are doing that exactly as my colleague said. First of all, of course, because we think it's good business. We've been in Africa for more than 100 years in certain countries, like Morocco or 50 years in uh, Ivory Coast or Cameroon. But beyond, because probably when you look at the demography, and here we talk long term, if we do not have a sustainable economic growth in Africa, it's a major problem for the stability of the world and of course to start with, with Europe. So here, the two goals, our business prospect, prospect, but also trying to contribute to something wider coincide. Um, at Molus, to what extent does a company face reputational risks in today's world if SDGs are not pursued and results are not communicated to all stakeholders publicly? Well, well, first of all, I think uh, a, a, a company, especially a public company like ours, uh, risks ignoring the SDG goals, ESG practice, uh, if, if you dismiss them altogether, for sure. Uh, I, I do think, though, there is a, uh, there is a risk. I mean, again, I, uh, there, and recently there's been a lot of report around an incident of a large asset manager in the U.S., uh, and its chief um, having made some very lewd remarks uh, about uh, females. And, um, you know, again, this goes towards equality in the workplace. This goes towards providing a decent workplace uh, for both genders. And um, the punishment, if you will, the reputational risk that came to bear and manifest itself was the uh, investors in the fund began withdrawing uh, the, uh, their money. So uh, certainly we can see clients, others, especially in the public markets, uh, do have this reputational risk. We've also seen shareholder activism, and we've seen shareholder activism on the part of the NGOs, especially when it comes to the pursuit of SDGs. So I do think that uh, some, especially in uh, the energy industry have faced this, and what we've seen in many of our clients uh, in the utility space is trying to get ahead of this trying to get ahead of this so they avoid the backlash. And although they may be operating in jurisdictions that don't require renewable portfolio standards or any kind of clean fuel requirement, they're actually getting out there in front of it to make sure that they um, sort of preempt uh, any kind of backlash. Mr. Froman, uh, MasterCard, you guys are connected to millions of enterprises worldwide. With such a huge network, how can you leverage that in the context of creating new partnerships that reinforce the SDG applications? Well, I think <clears throat> one thing we're focused on uh, is how do we use our network, our products, our technology, our expertise to address those kinds of goals. So uh, we set a goal a few years ago of bringing 500 million more people into the financial system. And we're there and we're now focused on what the next goal uh, will be. And it's not just bringing them into the financial system, but can you give them an on-ramp to the digital economy, which allows them to take full advantage of the kind of pathway to prosperity that the digital economy potentially provides. So on partnerships, we're working with Gavi, the Global Alliance on Vaccine Innovation, to use our technology, our, our chip, our card, to become effectively a electronic health record for vaccinations for kids. Um, and we're using our uh, technology with UNICEF to help families pay school fees to keep their kids in schools so they can graduate. Uh, we've got partnerships on the private sector side with companies like Unilever, where we're digitizing the relationship between a micro business and Unilever and a local bank, so that what used to be done in cash and was invisible is now visible to the bank. The bank can begin to extend credit, and more than half those SMEs are run by women. So it's a great way of bringing more women into the financial mainstream. We've got a ton of, uh, we've got over a billion people who don't have any formal identity. We have uh, more than a billion people who are still excluded from the financial system. 
digital tools give us the opportunity to really leapfrog and bring them in, but one really has to be mindful and concerted about it to make sure we're bringing uh, women and other people who might be otherwise marginalized from the system into the system so they can fully take advantage. Mr. Sathana, how do you view the impact versus return uh, debate? Is there really a trade-off between these two? No, there is no trade-offs. I, I think at the long run, we will all benefit from investing in SDGs. There will be, as I said before, there will be a quick win, something that you will invest in and you will see the return uh, quickly, highlighting some of the uh, country's initiatives like supporting the SMEs and the micro, micro businesses as well. So investing with them, extending your financing to them will have uh, a, a quick return and it's one of the SDGs. When we talk about housing as well, housing is a sustainable goal and investing with the Ministry of Housing and the Real Estate Development Fund as well will bring uh, a quick return to the banking industry. Uh, other other uh, initiatives or goals that investing in it will take a longer time, but we are committed to that. We launched our, our corporate or our sustainability strategy and we're touching seven of these SDGs. We know that some of them will have a quick return, some of them will have a longer return, some of them we are debating whether we will have uh, a quick return, but again, it is part of our community responsibility. Um, uh, quality education is something that we are committed to. Uh, gender equality, it is really important to us in Riyadh Bank, and, and we are proud to have uh, a big number of female in, in a various uh, senior positions as well. So we are committed to seven of these SDGs. Some of them, as I said, are quick returns, and we are realizing it now. Some of them will take longer. Some of them we are committed to it regardless if we see the returns of it or not. Mr. Binyan, Sabic is a global leader in the chemical industry. How are you applying um, SDGs, particularly in your product design and innovation? Uh, how are these being used in confronting sustainable development challenges? Of course, we, if you look at uh, where do we position sustainability within SABIC corporate organizations is part of our innovations and technology group. It's why, because this is going to uh, play a major role in order for us to push our sustainability programs and uh, provide us with the solutions to support the SDGs. Just recently, for example, uh, we have uh, announced what we call a true circle. This is a certified circular polymers basically have been utilized chemical recycling to produce from a mixed waste plastic, which is going to face one of the major challenges that the whole globe are facing, which of course is going to support SABIC uh, clear strategy with even very well-known uh, associations to support how going to overcome the plastic waste management programs globally. It's one of them, for example, the alliance uh, against the uh, end of waste plastic programs, which we have allocated more than 1.5 billion to 2.5 billion US dollars just to really combat it. This is directly linked with our SDGs program. That's one side. The other side, we need to have all the SDGs programs are integral part of our business planning and they have a specific target. We started long time ago. I mean, since 2010, we have been able to reduce the greenhouse uh, gas by almost 10 percent, energy consumptions by 6 percent. We have even the water by 11 percent. Not even that, because also we have been able to reduce the flaring emission by 43 percent. This is, will not be kept within SABIC. We, as a public traded company, we have to really share it with our investors, we have to share it with the NGOs, and also with all our other trade associations. We are probably we are only one of the few companies in Middle East that really produces the sustainability programs, which basically um, shows what SAPIC is doing for the SDGs. In the same time, we have also target for us, which is going to be work against us if we don't deliver on those targets. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that SAPIC just uh, last month, we have been awarded by the World uh, uh, Council, Business Council for Sustainability Developments, because we are one of the best in kind in terms of really sustainability linked to materiality. And that's something is very important that business take that uh, SDGs are seriously. Uh, Mr. Ben Slayim, um, 
at DP World also you have some investments into transportation and Hyperloop, I believe. Can you tell us a little bit, very briefly, uh, on that, please? Well, we uh, invested in this uh, futuristic technology uh, when we noticed that in our business could disrupt us because they're connecting cities to cities, which means there's no port in the middle. The interesting thing is this technology, as more and more we look at it, uh, it's green. The, the, the whole idea, really, when this is deployed, is that you'll be able to transport cargo with the speed of the air uh, transportation at the cost of the uh, trucking cost. When it comes to passengers, it's the same way. And basically, it uses an innovative system of using magnetic electricity that will convert, uh, create a magnetic field for levitation and for propulsion, uh, which is something new that nobody has done. But because it's our business, we have found this is necessary for us. But I can tell you one thing. Most of these SDGs are part of our business, and we benefit it. It's not like we say it's a target. We use them because they save us money, and they allow us to operate safely. So it makes sense uh, for you. Uh, uh, Mr. Odea, you've mentioned about following how much of your loans go to which sectors and uh, where are you targeting. Let's talk about a little bit about renewable energies and green technology. This is important in realizing SDGs. How committed are you in financing such projects at uh, SOCGEN? Yeah, well, first thing, I, I, I'm pretty proud that according to Robeco Sama, this year we ranked number one uh, bank globally on a worldwide, worldwide basis for our climate uh, change strategy. We had committed between 2016 to finance and 2020 to finance 100 billion euros of renewable, uh, 15 billion on the balance sheet, and uh, 85 through green bonds. Mid-2019, we were at 89 billion, so ahead of our target with much more on the balance sheet and in line with green bonds. And actually, we have recommitted for new uh, goals, 120 billion between 2019 and 2023, 120 billion. So it means it's real money. Uh, I've see, I see more and more demand for that, uh, for green bonds, and generally speaking, for renewable, because all the utility companies, all the energy companies, have to migrate their portfolios. And there is a very strong demand behind that and real opportunities of business for us, it's clear. Mr. Cantor, what can be done by governments to further ramp up the participation and engagement of businesses around the world? You know, I want to harken back to a statement that was made by Larry Fink in one of the earlier panels about uh, the fact that, um, you know, really we are all benefited by the private sector doing what it can and assuming the obligations of fulfilling these SDGs uh, rather than having governments come in and start requiring it. Uh, having served in government for a long time in our Congress in the U.S., I can tell you putting a, a legislative body such as that in charge of deciding how corporate America or corporate globally uh, would accomplish these goals is, I think, setting a bad precedent. And in fact, much of this discussion around our election coming up is going to be the role of government, whether it's capitalist system or, or socialist system. I just happen to believe that um, what government should do is create the environment for the private sector to do its job. And in that way, especially in the public company arena, uh, the government could begin to advocate for disclosure. Uh, as I said earlier, we already have a shareholder community um, very active on some of these issues uh, in terms of proxy contests and others uh, to uh, uh, really force uh, management into compliance or promotion of these SDGs. So I do think uh, disclosure on the part of uh, government requirement would be okay and regulators. I worry, though, if you look at some of the proposals uh, on the Democratic side in the U.S. and what, what some are advocating, uh, one senator in particular, Elizabeth Warren, is advocating a federal construct for corporate governance. Uh, to me, I think you are just treading down the wrong path. And so before that, something like that happens, uh, I'm a firm believer that just like all these uh, gentlemen here who have been advocating 
their own company's way of doing it, that we step it up so we don't have this kind of forced mechanism from the top. It won't end up good if, uh, if that happens. Mm -hmm. um, I think we don't have a, um, a lot of time, but I want to end with you, uh, Mr. Youssef, because it's really interesting, such big companies, industrial companies such as yourself, how do you actually measure your impact? Uh, and have you encountered any difficulties in, in measuring appropriately your impact, whether positive or negative? The good news uh, for our company, we have started a long time ago, and uh, yes, initially we have uh, faced some difficulties, how can we create the right measurements for our uh, SDGs, but I think my advice to company who's, I, I, I would second Eric, I think we should not wait for somebody to regulate what we should do, I think we should drive it. In the same times, you, you need to start putting the commitment for the SDGs and sustainability strategy initially without looking at how much this is going to create really a positive impact to your bottom line because you need to start the engine, then eventually you will build up the momentum that can provide a very good benefits. But I would like to also to end with the fact that we need to be agile because the issues around the SDGs and sustainability is not going to be something that is it going to be of a choice. It's going to be challenging both ends. One, from the consumer side, they will be demanding all the products, all the solutions has to be really certified from a sustainability point of view. And more importantly, who's going to deliver through a talent and generations that they take sustainability very serious. Uh, and I, I think eventually you will be finding, at least from, from my company, we have been very clear and successful driving the return investment and the impact on EBITDA on our sustainability very clearly on our balance sheet. Thank you. I think that's all the time that we, are, we have. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. A big applause for our panelists, and thank you, your audience. Thank you.